Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's BudSmart Roundtable Re Series webinar. My name is Ashley Robinson, and I'm the editor of BudSmart. Today, I'll be serving as your host for this webinar. Today's theme is cover crops. I'd like to take a minute first off to thank BASF and McCain for partnering with us on this Roundtable Series webinar. Today's presenters are Scott Gillespie, who is a regenerative ag consultant with Plants Dig Soil Consulting Limited, and Judith Niran Aza, who is a research scientist in nutrient management and soil health with AAFC Living Lab Atlantic. Atlantic. In today's webinar, you'll learn about the benefits of cover crops for soil information on cover crop trials using sorghum and pseudongrass, pearl millet, red clover, brown mustard, and a mixture of grasses and legumes, and the impacts of cover crops on potato yields. During the presentation, you'll likely have some questions for our speakers. Please type these into the chat box at any time during the webinar, and we'll address them during the question and answer session after the presentations. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available at spudsmart.com following this live event. Our first presenter is Scott Gillespie, who is, as I said before, a regenerative ag consultant with Plants Dig Soil Consulting Limited. Scott helps individuals and companies transition from conventional to regenerative agriculture through consulting, podcasting, and a monthly newsletter. He has a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture degree with a focus in agronomy from the University of Guelph and his Master of Science degree with a focus in plant science from the University of Manitoba. Along with being a certified, having certified crop advisor status, Scott is also registered with the Alberta Institute of Agrologists as a professional agrologist. Please take it away, Scott. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Ashley, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Making cover crops and regenerative agriculture practices work in potato production is a passion of mine. I've been thinking about how to make this work for many years, and I'm excited to present the case for using cover crops in potato production. I'm going to start my talk today with a list of good reasons to grow a cover crop. From there, I'll go to what I think are the better reasons to grow a cover crop. Next, I'll spend some time looking at how to think of them in return on investment, or ROI thinking. For the remainder of the talk, I'll go through an example applying this thinking to how to go about integrating cover crops into your operation. I'll end with some resources that you can follow up on later. So let us start with some good reasons to grow a cover crop. The first one is that the public is demanding regenerative agriculture practices. Regenerative agriculture has many aspects to it, but of course, the most common practice associated with it is cover crops. Following from that, the second reason for growing cover crop is that it seems there are many people growing them with great results. Prior to the pandemic closing down conferences and travel, there was a lively speaker circuit of what I call celebrity farmers and researchers talking about the many successes they had. Many were already on YouTube, but the pandemic only accelerated the number of videos that can be found out there. This is a good way to get inspired to change your operation, but it doesn't tell you how to actually implement it. Every geographical area is different and every farm has its own strengths and weaknesses. Most systems excluded potatoes as an option because the focus is, a, is on minimizing or eliminating tillage. It makes it hard to try when you're told that tillage destroys all the work that you're trying to accomplish. The third reason to grow cover crops that I've come up with is to gain some points on the latest survey. In the potato industry, we've seen many of these surveys over the years. Perhaps you've seen some show up in the other crops that you grow. Cover crops are widely seen as a good practice by those that develop the surveys, so it may be a good reason to start. Closely related to this is reason number four get more contract in the future. Potato end users are starting to expect this and it may be the way that they decide on who gets the contract. Finally, you may have heard of growers that are making money from selling carbon credits. Cover crops growing in the off season are the key to making these systems work. While it can seem straightforward, the science is not clear in this yet and the markets are volatile. 
the worth of the carbon may be mostly dependent on government policy now and in the future. I'd like to shift now to what I call better reasons to grow a cover crop. I have them sorted into three groups of reasons. The first set of reasons is to hold the soil in place and to hold on to the nutrients. To me, this is something that will always pay. Losing soil costs you money. You may be able to compensate for it by adding more fertilizer, but you lose much, much more than that. A few years ago, while out soil sampling, I saw some soil that had been blown into a ditch. There had been a wind event that had moved the soil from a newly harvested potato field. I probed a bunch of spots in it and put them in one of my bags. I had the lab determine the soil texture so that I had a scientific basis for classifying it. It was basically beach sand, right on the line between a sandy loam and a loamy sand. It was 78% sand, 10% clay, and 12% silt. In southern Alberta, we farm in a semi-arid area near the Rocky Mountains. It gets very little rain. Our soils are called brown soils because historically, and I'm talking thousands of years, they don't produce a lot. 2% organic matter is considered good in the area. I don't know what the native prairie would have been, but I know some grassland that had never been farmed and had only been grazed with cattle was 2.8% organic matter when I tested it. This blown beach sand soil was 2.4% organic matter. There wasn't much nitrogen in it, but that's to be expected as nitrogen gases off or leaches very easily. What was surprising is that the phosphorus was 164 parts per million, or just over 300 pounds per acre for every six inches of depth. Phosphorus is typically low in our soils without a lot of manure or fertilizer over the years. We have naturally high potassium levels in our soils, but even this was high at 820 parts per million, or over 1,600 pounds per acre. I won't go through the micronutrients, but even all of them were above critical numbers. Some are even in the moderate to high range. <clears throat> when you hold onto the soil, you hold onto your nutrients. We don't tend to be at excess moisture levels here, even with all the irrigation we use. But if you regularly have water flowing through your profile, you can lose the mobile nutrients, such as nitrogen. To me, this is the best reason to grow a cover crop holding onto soil and nutrients. With current fertilizer prices, this pays even more now. The next set of reasons to grow a cover crop is to increase water infiltration, increase nutrient availability, and to lower pest pressures. Water infiltration may be increased within weeks of a cover crop being established, but it's more likely something that will gain over multiple cycles. Water infiltration is not the total amount the soil can hold, this refers to how fast the water can move into the soil. When you have good water infiltration, you can take in rainstorms quickly and have less runoff. When irrigated, you can put on more water at a time. If you can grow a legume cover crop and incorporate or leave all of it in place, then you have a chance to increase the nitrogen content of your soil. For this, works, for this to work, it needs to grow long enough to grow significant biomass and it must have actively producing nodules. Phosphorus can't be easily mined from the soil, no matter what the celebrity farmers say. Microbial mining of soil particles is a fact. However, the rate that it occurs at is a fraction of what we export in a crop off the land each year. What we can tap into, and I think the no fertilizer added people are actually using, is the legacy phosphorus. Phosphorus fertilizer gets tied up quickly in the soil and is slowly, slowly released over the years and decades that follow. If a cover crop does the work to liberate this instead of your cash crop, and its decomposition coincides with your cash crop growth, you may be able to access this before it again gets tied up. The final reason in this middle section of better reasons to grow a cover crop is to lower pest pressure. Herbicide tolerant weeds are a common reason that most farmers in the United States get into cover crops. And this is where they have the most success. By covering the land with the best species for the job, they crowd out the undesirable species. It's not 100% control, but it may allow them to use the herbicides that they do have more effectively. Insect and disease suppression is where I get the most excited in the potential of cover crops. In my example later in this presentation, I'll be going over one system that seems to be working well. 
In the next presentation of the webinar, Dr. J Judith DeRanza will be presenting some of her work on this, and I'm excited to learn more on this. Many times I hear that just putting in cover crops, especially cocktail mixes of 10 to 15 species, is enough to get the biology working for you. But I think it's not quite that easy. Targeted species for the specific pests is what you need. In the final block of better reasons to grow a cover crop, I have increasing the organic matter of the soil and increasing the water holding capacity. These are long-term plays that you will not likely see a change in for decades. They may only benefit the next generation coming up on the farm. Organic matter can appear to be building quickly on a soil, but the stable form of it takes many years and takes many cycles of growth and decay. This will in turn help the total amount of water and nutrients you can hold in your soil. This won't pay you back directly, but if you get the payback and the short and medium term benefits, you will build long term foundations. This leads me to the next section of my talk, return on investment. To illustrate the concept, I want you to think about something that all potato growers use, fungicides. Even if you're organic, I'm sure you've used an organic approved product. The first application will usually give the greatest return. Think about the week before canopy closure. Early blight may or may not be appearing, but as soon as the canopy closes, it has the ideal environment. The humidity will be higher and the spores will be coming from the soil. Good coverage slows or stops this initial infection and makes the whole rest of the season easier. If you only sprayed once, this is the one that would give you the most money back. Throughout the season, the subsequent sprays should continue to give you more money back than you spend on the product and the application costs. Scouting, spore traps, weather, irrigation, and other factors will help, will play into how many sprays, what products, and how often they're used. The best time to stop is just before the cost is greater than the return. Shifting back to cover crops, if you can solve an immediate problem, you should get a payback within the growing season. Holding onto your soil and or the nutrients pays back right away. Solving a short-term problem should still pay back more money than more than the money that was spent. It can be tough to see the payback immediately on this, um, as it could take until the next year's potato year to see the difference. This is why it's so important to use the right species for the job. If you focus on immediate and short-term returns, the organic matter that was produced by the cover crop stays in the system and contributes to the long-term stable organic matter. Unlike a fungicide with a cover crop, the short-term benefits will feed into the long-term benefits. Once the season is over, all of the fungicide that was sprayed is slowly dissipated and broken down in the soil. It may even be contributing to more problems in the future as organisms develop resistance. There may even be long-term effects on the soil microbial community that are causing hidden harms to your soil. I'm not saying that you don't use a fungicide, you still get the benefits from it. Even if it's causing some long-term problems, the short-term benefits, that is a high yielding crop, outweighs the costs. The switch in thinking is that with a cover crop, the short-term benefits pay you back now as well as contribute to the long-term benefits. So let us work through an example now. A good solution to erosion control and nutrient scavenging is to spread the cheapest cereal seeds you can get a hold of. I'm choosing a cereal because they're one of the fastest growing cover crops we have, and most of us will have experience growing them as cash crops. We know how they behave, and we know how to kill them in subsequent crops. You can spread them with a spin spreader or drill them with existing equipment. If you're set up to spread ahead of harvest or have aerial options, you may be able to do that and have the harvesting process plant them. A better solution is to use the right species for the job. Fall rye or cereal rye, as it's more commonly known as in the United States, can be beat. It germinates in cold weather, it overwinters in most areas, and grows very early in the spring. The biggest disadvantage is that it can be too good at its job. 
you must have a plan to control it in the following spring. You may want to consider using a less aggressive winter cereal such as triticale or wheat, but of course you'll trade off cold season germination and growth. However, if you drill them in and get a good catch, you may just be able to let it grow to maturity and sell it as a cash crop. An advanced solution is, uh, to this is to start in the year prior to potatoes. You'll do what I call supercharging the system. You'll take the entire year out of cash crop production and grow a green manure crop that you chop and immediately disc into your soil. If you're set up to mark rows or form the hills in the fall prior to potato production, you can do that right away. Decaying plant material will hold the soil in place better than having nothing there. It's not perfect, but it will give you that help to give you that bridge. You should plant something on the top of the hills um, or spread a cereal in advance of making the hills to have something growing uh, as the decaying organic matter loses its effect. Whether or not you mark the rows in the fall, you'll want to have something that winter kills or is easily killed prior to planting. Current equipment constrains what we can do as most of it's designed to work in tilled soils. Innovation is happening though. Chad Berry in Manitoba has adapted his equipment to work in the minimally tilled soils. Between this and manufacturers stepping up, I think we'll have many more options in the next five to 10 years. This could be tough to justify taking an entire year out of potato production. In the Pacific Northwest of the United States, they can make this work by doing a green manure after winter wheat harvest, but they have a much longer growing season. It's been proven that you need big biomass to make this work. To increase the return on investment, choosing the right species for the job may give you more back in the year of potato production than you lose by not having a cash crop. The green manure work I've been referring to uses mustard to help control disease. Specifically, it's being used to suppress the early die complex of organisms. It is well studied and well used in the Pacific Northwest. To do it right, you need big biomass, you need to chop it at the right time, and you need to immediately, within minutes, get it incorporated into the soil. I've heard that some people even, I have heard from some people that even the variety of mustard is important. Some do, a much better job than others at controlling disease. This may be dependent on environment and species that make up the disease complex in your field. Now the super advanced solution to this is to integrate cover crops for disease and or insect control, weed suppression and water infiltration into the years between potatoes. This should benefit you by not letting the pests get to high numbers. Over time, this will increase organic matter and the water holding capacity of the soil. It should also give you more stable nutrient cycles. Of course, the biggest problem with this is how to justify it on rented land. Or maybe you don't know who will be farming the land in five to 10 years. It can be hard to work on something when you're just farming year to year. This is beyond the scope of what I'm presenting on today, but perhaps in the Q&A later, we can talk on ideas for how to solve this. So time is closing in on me, and most likely you've learned as much from me as you can for now. To review, what I've talked about, first, I put forward good reasons to grow a cover crop. Public demand, increased contracts, and carbon credits are all good reasons, but they depend on external incentives. If policy changes or markets crash, you have no value. Better reasons to grow cover crops benefit you directly. Holding onto soil, holding onto nutrients, Capturing and storing water efficiently and lowering pest pressures pay you back now and in the future. Advanced and super advanced practices will help those of you who are in it for the long term or who have an eye on the future caretakers of the land. Look for the return on investment in the short term, and this will help you to pay for the long term. Unlike inputs such as fungicides, the residual benefits of cover crops can accrue over time. To get a different perspective on this, I suggest you check out the Fieldwork podcast. It's farmers talking to farmers, and there are two episodes that directly relate to this topic. 
The cotton industry is very far removed from us, but the consumer pressures and pressures on farming are similar. The first episode covers the industry side and the second, the farmer side. Cover crops help save a grower from herbicide tolerant weeds. He also has very clear thinking on seeing return on investment in all that he does. Dr. Andrew McGuire has helped to research and develop mustard green manure systems in potato production. Start on any of his articles and I'm sure you'll learn something. His thinking has influenced how I go about integrating cover crops into potato production. And finally, check out my podcast. I love talking about realistic regen ag and look forward and put together something like this um, about this length every month in the growing season. I look forward to chatting with you after Judith Niranza's presentation. Thanks, Scott. That was a really great overview and introduction to the world of cover cropping. And so please remember, if you have any questions for the presenters, type these into the chat box and anytime during the webinar, and we'll address them during the question and answer session after the presentation. Our next presenter is Judith Niranaza, who is a research scientist and nutrient man research scientist in nutrient management and soil health with AAFC Living Lab Atlantic. Judith holds a Bachelor of Science degree in agronomy and a Master of Science in crop and soil sciences from Michigan State University and a PhD in soil and environment from Laval University. Her research has contributed to increasing agricultural productivity and enhancing environmental performance. Judith has focused on better understanding nitrogen and carbon cycling in diverse cropping systems and identifying strategies to enhance phosphorus use efficiency in acidic soils. She tests different agricultural practices to enhance soil organic matter in low residue cropping systems. Take it away, please, Judith. Thank you, Ashre, for uh, the introduction and uh, for uh, the invitation, and to Scott uh, for a good introduction to cover crop. So today, um, I'm going to talk about assessing cover crop impacts on nitrogen cycling, potato yield, and soil properties in EPI. And uh, this is a work um, that was realized in collaboration with uh, many people. So I would like to thank uh, my former um, graduate student, Jennifer Whitaker, and uh, many uh, scientists from uh, Charlottetown and Fredericton and uh, in Brandon, Manitoba, and the PI Potato Board. And uh, most importantly, I would like to acknowledge my research assistant, uh, Daniel Monahan and the other research assistant who contributed to field work and lab work, uh, Dorothy Gregory, Irene Power, Barb Anman, and the Doharrington Farm Crew. I will start with a short uh, introduction um, regarding the context for people who are not familiar with uh, PEI uh, agricultural systems. So PEI uh, represents only 0.5% uh, of agricultural cropland in Canada, and yet it has produced more than 20% of Canadian potato production. Potato production has been linked to groundwater nitrate contamination and anoxic events in estuaries, and PEI uh, is groundwater dependent for its drinking water. So it's really important when we assess the benefits of cover crop to look also at how they contribute to reduce nitrate leaching risk. PI has observed stagnant potato marketable yield in last years. That was attributed to combined factors such as disease pressure, drought spells, and soil degradation. So in cropping systems with limited access to manure and compost, cover crops become important to sustain crop production. There are many trials right now in PEI testing a large diversity of cover crops. The report of the Commission on Nitrate in Groundwater had many recommendations. Among those recommendations, 
there was a mandatory three-year crop rotation system. So it stated this way, it is recommended that a province-wide mandatory three-year crop rotation in fields under regulated crop production with no exemptions be implemented. So uh, traditionally, um, PI farmers uh, adopted a rotation that included barley underseeded with red clover in year one. In year two, we had red clover and in year three, potatoes. This would be a good rotation in the sense that it will provide a ground cover after barley harvest. So during fall and winter, we would have a covered land and then we would have a growth of red clover in the second year, which contributes to minimize the soil disturbance. However, red clover um, has been a host for wireworm, Veticillium modalihe and root lesion nematodes. So it's being um, not adopted as it used to be in the past. And we have ongoing research to find alternative cover crops to red clover. In addition, red clover in its second year uh, traditionally is uh, incorporated in a form which contribute also uh, to release nitrogen and increase nitrate leaching to groundwater. So the objective uh, for this presentation and the, the study behind was to investigate how different potato rotations, including different cover crops, impact nitrogen cycling, potato yield, and soil health. And red clover is always used as a check given uh, the, that is a traditional um, cover crop in PI. So the results I will present are from different research trials conducted between 2013 and 2018. For certain study, we have completed two cycle of rotation. So that means we have six year data and each treatment is replicated three to four times. So the questions to answer across all trials are the following. How much carbon and nitrogen are returned to the soil by different cover crop? What is the impact on nitrate leaching risk? What is the impact on subsequent potato yield? What is the impact on soil quality? Uh, in this case, uh, we are presenting the coronary soil health related parameters and impact on soil nitrogen supply capacity. I want to explain how we calculated this soil nitrogen supply capacity in the next slide. So basically, um, the potato comes following a cover crop and during the potato phase, we take the main plot for each treatment and we split in two halves. So we have one side where we apply recommended nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium. And then we'll have the other half where we don't, we don't apply nitrogen fertilizer. So we just apply phosphorus and potassium. So what we call the soil nitrogen supply capacity is the total nitrogen accumulated in vines and tubers before vine senescence. Basically, we dig uh, the whole plant, we separate the above ground and the tubers, and we weigh them, and then we analyze them for the dry matter, and we analyze them for carbon and nitrogen content. That's what is called plant bioassay approach. We also do a monthly soil sampling to analyze nitrate at two depth, 0 0.15 and 15 to 30 centimeter depth. Normally, our monthly soil nitrate analysis, we do that across all plots, but I will focus only on the nitrate taken in the plot without nitrogen fertilizer, because we are more likely to see differences in this plot than sampling on the plot that received nitrogen fertilizer, because every time we are sampling here, we are basically sitting on the top of fertilizer.
So let's uh, talk about our first study. It's a study where we uh, compared three year potato rotation systems. So we were having an objective of comparing a grass a legume and a grass mixed with legume. Basically for the legume, we have barley underseeded with clover in year one, then we have clover in second year, and barley underseeded with clover mixed with Timothy, clover mixed with Timothy in the second year, and barley underseeded with Timothy, Timothy growing in the second year, and potatoes were uh, grown in all plot in the third year. So during uh, the cover crop phase in the second year, we observed what a, a grower would normally do with a first cut in June, a second cut in August, and sometime we have a cut in um, September or October, a third cut. Before, uh, so the cover crop are frayed and mowed and the biomass is left on the ground. And before um, cutting the cover crop, we uh, took a sample to quantify uh, the dry matter biomass and to analyze for carbon and nitrogen content. So the cover crop dry matter that implies is the sum of all dry matter we obtained by additioning, by summing or different cuts. So here we have the first cycle and the second cycle. And on the y-axis, we have cover crop dry matter in megagram per hectare or metric ton per hectare. So what we observe here is that red clover and red clover mixed with Timothy, they have comparable values and you have low, lower value with Timothy. And we have up to uh, 7.2 uh, metric ton per hectare of dry matter. For the cover crop for carbon accumulation and return to the soil, uh, this is going all the way to respect the cover crop dry matter. So this is the same trend as in the previous slide. And we have up to uh, 3000 kilogram of carbon return to the soil with low value with Timothy. For the cover crop nitrogen accumulation, so that is nutrient uptake, we observe significantly lower value with Timothy and uh, the red clover and the red clover mixed with Timothy tends to be associated with higher value. And we have a maximum of 138 kilogram of nitrogen per hectare. We um, quantified also the monthly uh, nitrate uh, during potato phase in the plot with no fertilizer. So the results I'm presenting here are related to the uh, top depth, so zero to 15 centimeter. And we have uh, the top figure is for showing the uh, first cycle and uh, the bottom figure is showing the second cycle. So what we did observe is that we have comparable values at most sampling date and higher values with red clover, but at certain sampling date, not always. And we observed the same trend for 15 to 30 centimeter. Soy nitrogen supply to potato, uh, as I uh, discussed before, this is a total nitrogen accumulated before vine kill. And we did observe that uh, Timothy supplied half of nitrogen that was supplied by red clover and red clover mixed with Timothy. And you have a values ranging from 34 to 105 kilogram of nitrogen per hectare. That is the amount of carbon supplied by the soil alone without any fertilizer. When we analyze the um, impact of uh, the cover crop on potato yield, we observe comparable values among the treatments. And we assessed also the potato yield response to nitrogen fertilizer application. And we did see significant potato yield response to nitrogen fertilizer with higher value obtained when fertilizer was applied 
than when nitrogen fertilizer was omitted. So we assessed uh, different um, parameters of coronary comprehensive soil health assessment. So we have soil organic matter, aggregate stability, available water content, respiration, protein index, active carbon, and pH. We also have data for nutrient, but are not presented because there were no uh, significant differences. So what we did observe after six years, cover crop including legumes, red clover, or a mixture of red clover and timothy, they showed significantly higher values of aggregate stability, soil respiration, protein index, and active carbon than timothy alone. So the second uh, study, uh, we had uh, two cash crop um, every three years. Again, we are comparing three rotation systems. So we have grain corn followed by sorghum Sudan grass, barley underseeded red clover followed by red clover, soybean uh, followed by brown mustard, and then we have potatoes in the third year for all um, crop plots. So mustard has been widely grown as a bifumigant uh, crop to control wireworm. And uh, sorghum sudan grass also has been um, associated with um, ability to boost potato yield and reducing nitrate leaching risk. So we wanted to see how these cover crop behave in comparison to a rotation that included red clover. So we, as, we established these trials um, by uh, establishing them in one feed starting in 2015, and then in another adjacent feed starting in 2016. By doing this, we can have, uh, we can validate data obtained in one feed with data in second feed, and we can have interesting information after four years instead of waiting uh, six years working on the same field. So what did you observe in terms of cover crop dry matter? So we, we did observe that in the site, the second site, we see lower dry matter with mustard than red clover and sorghum. And we have up to seven uh, metric ton per hectare. So I want you to Observe that in the first site, we did see lower uh, dry matter biomass for red clover. This is because um, in this field, red clover plots were plowed by mistake in the second year. So we had to replant a uh, red clover. So here you are seeing a uh, biomass for only one growing season versus a uh, biomass when you have two years of growth for red clover. For the cover crop nitrogen accumulation, we did see that red clover was associated with higher nitrogen return to the soil with a maximum of 167 kilogram of nitrogen per hectare. For the cover crop um, carbon accumulation, we did see a trend where the lower carbon returned to the soil with mustard than red clover and sorghum, and up to uh, 3,200 kilograms of carbon returned to the soil. For the monthly nitrate during potato phase in the plot without a nitrogen fertilizer, we did see higher nitrate with red clover at a certain sampling date for the top depth, 0 to 15 centimeters. And the same when we checked for the depth of 15 to 30 centimeters. Potato yield, again, we find comparable potato yield among the treatments. And when we analyze the response to nitrogen fertilizer, we did observe in one case, the first site, we did see there were a um, significant response of to nitrogen fertilizer. In the second site, we did see that even if we see a trend toward higher um, value with um, nitrogen application, this value were uh, statistically uh, comparable. 
For the coronary soil health assessment for this uh, rotation, we observed comparable values among treatment. At one site, though, we did see that red clover was associated with higher soil respiration and active carbon than mustard and sorghum. We observe also higher phosphorus and potassium with sorghum due to nutrient supply when seeding sorghum. I will uh, just share uh, this uh, trial. This is a third, a third uh, uh, study, but I will not spend too much time on this because this uh, uh, paper is online, so everyone can check it. This project is still going on under Living Lab. It's a project where we are comparing a different cover crop with and without manure. And in this uh, cover crop, um, we have grasses, legumes, and a mixture of legumes and grasses. So this was a two-year uh, study. For instance, we have alfalfa mixed with ultra grass, sorghum sudan grass, rye grass, common vetch, and crimson clover, forage permitted, sorghum sudan grass mixed with verticillium resistant alfalfa, and winter rye and hairy vetch. This is the highlight for this first cycle of rotation. We did see highest dry matter biomass with forage permitted. We did see that sorghum sudan grass and the forage per millet were associated with higher potato yield and lower nitrate reaching risk. We observed that mixing grasses with legumes decreased nitrate reaching risk compared to red clover. And we observed also that cow manure increased potato yield by 28%. And we observed that lower number of root lesion nematode with sorghum sudan grass and forage per millet. To summarize, red clover improved certain early indicator of soil health faster than grasses or brown mustard, but it also increased the soil nitrogen supply capacity and the risk of nitrate leaching. Red clover was not associated with increased potato yield, Mixing legumes with grasses so that the grass is dominant would decrease the risk of nitrate leaching without impacting potato yield. In the recently published article, sorghum sudan grass and forage per minute returned high biomass, enhanced yield, reduced the soil nitrate leaching risk, and have the potential to decrease root region nematodes. And we need more than one cycle to notice changes in the soil properties. This is the end of my presentation. I thank everyone for joining and I would welcome your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Judith. That was super interesting. So next we're gonna start the question and answer session. And if you have any questions that you haven't typed yet, please uh, type them now. So our first question comes from Guy Madison and he's asking, when planting a different cover crop, should the seed be treated for different uh, soil pathogens, pathogens or is it better to go naked with no seed treatment? And I'll just leave this one open to the floor because I think both of you guys could answer this well. <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> um, I'll go first. You can hear me, correct? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I would say it's going to depend on what you have to deal with, but I think it's going to be better to use a treatment if it's going to mean that you're going to get a quicker establishment um, of your crop or of your cover crop. So as an example, I know this is this is an insect, but um, a lot of growers in our area have had problems with tillage radish because they try to plant it in um, in August here. And that's the time when the flea beetles are completing their second phase of their cycle. And there's been complete um, complete stand failures of tillage radish because the, the flea beetles come in and just eat it all up. Um, so I think the best thing is if, if it's going to, if it's going to help you to get a better stand, then um, you should be using something. Thank you. And our next question is for Judith. It comes from Ricardo Griffin, and he's asking if there's any data with white clover instead of red clover. 
Good question. Um, I know uh, some of my uh, collaborators uh, may be testing this, but personally, I have not tested this. So we should definitely keep our eyes open for some stuff coming from AAFC then on it. Yeah. And um, I have a question myself. So this one's for Judith. Um, of course, you're testing these varieties and you're growing in a maritime climate. Um, what do you think, uh, would any of them work, do you think, for central Canada when we're looking at Quebec or Ontario or into the prairies? I would say so. Uh, I think uh, these were the um, full season cover crop seeded, you know, in spring or early, early summer. So I would say that those tested here would would work also in other climate, in Canadian climate. Thank you. And we have a question from Thea Van Beers, and she's asking, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. <laughs> um, are you sure about the host status of sorghum for root Ligenella ne nematodes? Dutch research proved the opposite. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I would connect him with uh, uh, Chen Dahu is a wild phytopathologist. So, who actually those data was provided were provided from from him? Yes, that's the, the the data we found. They were we have low numbers of root lesion nematode, but it's this study is continuing. So we are in the second cycle of the rotation. So, as I I I, I showed, you know, we we need more than one cycle. So if what we observed in the first cycle is confirmed in this year of 2021, then that should be right. But we may see the opposite. I don't know if Dahu is connected, but uh, yes, it would be better to put in contact. Thank you. That's really interesting, uh, especially when you're getting to comparing um, these studies that we're seeing in different places, especially with the Dutch. They're such a big potatoes grower, as we all know. Um. And I think that is all we have then. Thank you guys so much. And so I'd just like to once again, uh, thank our speakers, Scott and Judith for joining us today. You both did a great job and I know I personally learned a lot. And I would also once again, like to thank our sponsors, BASF and McCain for making this webinar possible. And a big thank you also goes out to everyone who participated. I hope you have found this information valuable. Again, a recording of this webinar will be made available on spudsmart.com. Thanks again, and we hope you have a wonderful day.